Hi, um, I'm Karen Schulmeyer. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this work. Um, one of my favorite things to do has always been teaching field schools, so this was really a perfect job for me to get to come here and teach a field school every year. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this project we've been doing in the Upper Gila, and it combines teaching a field school and also research in this area. And I really like both of those things because I get to train the next generation of archaeologists, and I get to do it in the context of this really interesting research in a really special part of the Southwest that I think has uh, interesting things to say about the past and interesting things to say about some issues that we're facing today also. So my talk today really has two parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about the teaching part and the students and what our field school's about. And I'm going to talk about some of the research that we're doing and why we're out there and what the students are doing when they're working with us. So it's kind of in two halves. And I get to be here today talking about this. And I get to be out there in the summer ordering a bunch of people around. But <laughs> this work is really not just done by me. We have a really good field team. And I just wanted to, instead of waiting to mention that at the end, I wanted to bring that up at the very beginning because it's a really important part of what we do out there. So back at the office, as Bill was mentioning, we have the Gila kind of divvied up into sections so that nobody has to think about the whole thing at once. And this is kind of what we do in the field, too. And I was really lucky that I inherited a great field school structure uh, our field school before I got here was run by Brett Hill and then by Deb Huntley. And so when I got here, there was already a really good system set up. And I get to work with really great people. Jeff Clark, who's over at that table back there, is my co-PI on the grant that uh, paid for some of this. And he's the project director with me. Uh, and he's a really great person to throw ideas around with and figure out what to do when problems come up and things like that. Uh, we have a staff that comes out every year and helps with the teaching and the research parts. Uh, and that's also really important because otherwise, it's really, really hard to do a project like this with few people. So uh, you can see a picture of some of them in front of the sign at Chaco Canyon. But uh, Leslie Aragon's our field director, which means that she runs the excavation site. Alan DeNoyer runs the uh, hands-on part of the field school where students learn to, to make things. I'll talk more about all these things as we go on. Uh, Stacy Ryan does lithic analysis. Uh, Lewis Bork, Barry Steinbrecher, Evan Giomi have all on and off done survey and also excavation. Uh, Lisa Palacios and Real, Will Russell have done excavation. So these are people who are teaching the students what to do and also doing the research. They're digging all day and they're analyzing stuff all night, it seems like. So it's really important to have all these people out here. And then finally, our students, who I'm going to be talking a lot about today. And you can see photos of our last four years since I've been here. But we had a bunch of other students since I think it was 2008. We've had students working in the field out here. So everything that I talk about really comes from this whole big group of people working together uh, who I'm lucky to get to uh, work with and boss around a little bit every summer. We've been really lucky since I got here. And this is another thing I kind of inherited from Deb Huntley. Uh, we've been getting grants through the National Science Foundation program called, it's at REU, which stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And this program is set up to help undergraduates get involved in research. I think traditionally, a lot of students have started to get involved in research by volunteering at labs and things like that on their campus. But when you ask people to do an unpaid volunteer position, that actually cuts out a lot of students who need to work part time while they're in school. And this is especially a problem for archaeologists because a lot of our hands on research is in the summer. And students who have to work at a job in the summer to pay for their classes the rest of the year would get kind of left out of this. Field schools, they weren't that expensive when I was a student, but they're up, they're all over $4,000 now, all the ones that I know of, at least in the Southwest, it's over $4,000. Uh, that's tuition and food and all of your expenses while you're in the field. So not only are people away from home and unable to earn money, but they have to pay all this money to go to field school. So the RU program is set up to address this kind of issue, and it gives the undergraduates who come with us a stipend every year, which covers uh, about three quarters of their expenses. And that lets people into archaeology who otherwise would have a hard time doing something like this. So we're really, really lucky that we've been able to uh, get these grants and be a part of this program and help get people into archaeology, who some of whom otherwise might not have had, had a chance to. Some of our really good students every year have told me at the end, I'm so glad that I got into this program because without the RU, I couldn't have afforded to do this. So that makes me feel really good that we're helping people get into this field who otherwise would have trouble doing something like this in the summer. So it's been a really, really important program for us. Just some stats on the numbers of students we've had. We've been partnering with the University of Arizona since 2011. 
And uh, students, it, this is U of A course, so students go out and learn to do archaeology through this University of Arizona course. Um, so when, since 2011, when it moved to U of A, we've had 87 students, and they've come from 27 different states, and those are the ones you can see in red on that map, which is pretty amazing. So although it's a U of A program, it's definitely not all U of A students. A few are, and then there's a lot from a lot of different places. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is get a diverse group of students involved in archaeology, and that's part of the goal of the NSF RU program in general, is to get a whole bunch of different students involved from different places. Um, so you can see some numbers on different numbers of students we've had, uh, underrepresented groups in archaeology. One of those groups is actually community college students and students from small colleges, because uh, those places traditionally don't have a whole bunch of archaeologists on staff. They're lucky if they have one, in fact. Uh, some of the community colleges we've been working with for a while do have good archaeology programs, but they usually only have one or two archaeologists. So that means that there aren't a whole lot of field opportunities for students at those places, and they need to go to another institution sometimes to get field training. So uh, we've been really happy to get students from those small colleges and community colleges involved, especially. And this is really, this is important for archaeology because if all of us come from the same kind of background, if we've all gone to a big four-year university, if we've all grown up in a big city, if everyone's grown up exactly like me, basically, um, we only get a certain set of viewpoints in the field. We all tend to think of some of the same things. There's gonna be some differences, but you're missing a lot of views if you, all, if you get just people from one background. So part of the reason for our use in general and part of what we're trying to do is make sure that we get people from all different places, all different kinds of schools, all different kinds of backgrounds involved in archeology, span uh, and that really increases the numbers of ideas that we're going to come up with. And I can see this just from working in, with the students that we have. Some of our students think of things that I wouldn't think of, but they think of things in kind of a different way. Uh, and it's important for us not to lose that. So that's another reason that the REO program is really beneficial, as it lets, uh, like, brings more diversity into our field and more voices and people thinking of new ideas that I wouldn't necessarily come up with. So sometimes this is hard. Uh, when you have a whole bunch of different people, sometimes not everyone thinks the same way. <laughs> I really like this picture. These three students are actually best friends. Um, <laughs> this was a photo from last summer, and these three students, um, what's the thing now instead of Facebook? Snapchat. They Snapchat each other like twice a week, so they're really good friends, but it looks like they're having a really fierce argument. I think they were talking about dirt. <laughs> but having a really diverse group is not always an easy thing. Diversity is hard sometimes. And every week, every summer for six weeks, we're stuck out there with 20 people, 12 undergrads, usually a couple of grad students and some staff, uh, most of whom never met each other before, many of whom probably wouldn't have picked each other to spend six weeks with, and we're stuck. We're pretty isolated, this group of us, for six solid weeks. And people come from all different places, as I was saying, all different backgrounds. Some of that is relatively easy, like, oh, how exciting, you're from this state, you're from that state. But then you run into people who have very fundamentally different beliefs about things, about religion, about politics, about all the things you try not to talk about at Thanksgiving. And <laughs> we're spending six weeks together and we cannot get away from each other. So diversity is sometimes hard. It doesn't always work out great, but usually we're trapped together enough we have to work through some of these things. And you end up meeting people that you would never have met and our students end up meeting and becoming friends with people that they maybe never thought that they would meet or become friends with, and that's really good, uh, especially at a time when a lot of people talk about the problem of having bubbles. We tend to interact with people who are like us and who share many of the same ideas that we do. You can't be in a bubble when you're camping for six weeks with people, so we all have to kind of get outside of our, our normal interaction zones and meet some new people. And we often end up really becoming friends with these people and coming to value them and understand their perspectives a lot more. So this is a really important thing, not just for archaeology, but I think for people in general to do. So that's been a really beneficial thing as well, even though it sometimes makes us very, very tired. <laughs> <laughs> and our students go on to do really exciting things. Uh, they're with us for six weeks, and then they disperse back to the universities and colleges that they came from. Uh, not all of them stay in touch, but a lot of them do. That's one of the good things about social media. I'm in touch with a lot of these people through Facebook and things like that, and sometimes we email each other. And it's really fun to see what they go on to do next. Uh, one thing that we do in the field, I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, is that our students do projects for an outreach fair at the end of the field season. They pick something that they're interested in, and they do a poster on it, and they prepare a little presentation for people in the community to come and see. 
And some of our students every year continue those things or they adapt them into new interests. Uh, and they do class projects where they've continued these things, or they do honors theses at their universities, or they turn these into presentations at professional meetings. So you can see uh, a picture of Marcy there who's doing her project uh, on a picnic table outside, obviously, at our outreach fair. And then there's another photo of her at the Southwest Symposium, which is a professional meeting for archaeologists talking about her research. And you can see this much more professional looking poster that she came up with. Uh, so we have students every year who do that. We have students who go on to get lab internships at their universities or at other places. Johnny, the guy with the grinding stones down there, uh, ended up working in an archaeological chemistry lab uh, with someone that he met who was a visitor to our field school. Uh, he's also doing an honors thesis and working on an SAA poster. We have students who've done internships uh, at places like the National Park Service. That's a really popular one. Uh, Adam Sazate did an internship with Pima County. So they go on to do a lot of really interesting things right away after they work with us. And it's fun to see what they pick and where they go and the different connections that they make. And then some of them who've been out a little bit longer go on to do other things. Uh, most of, I think, most or all, all the ones I'm in touch with, at least, of our community college students go on to four-year universities somewhere else. You can see a picture of a couple of them from Cochise College, which we've had a lot of students from over the years. Uh, both of those students are going to be starting at U of A in the fall, and they're really excited about that. Uh, some of them go on to PhD programs, places like Buffalo, uh, SUNY Binghamton, all different places around the country, University of New Mexico. Uh, some of them go on to CRM jobs. Uh, Katie Kamita, who's wearing that very, very bright colored vest. Uh, I just, this is a picture of last week when we saw her, no, not even last week, like four days ago. <laughs> we saw her uh, working for Logan Simpson Design and she's wearing that gear because she's working in a highway right of way. She just, she graduated, graduated from college, moved out to Tucson, got a job working in a CRM company. So it's really fun to see all these things that they go on to do. Uh, Daniel in the National Park Service uniform, taking a selfie with his phone. Um, he has his dream job now. Since he was a little kid, he wanted to be a park ranger at the Everglades. He's from Florida. And uh, after he worked with us, he graduated from college and he got a job being a park ranger at the Everglades. So I think it's amazing. It's so neat to see what these people do next. Uh, and then Peter, who's in the bottom corner, uh, I just talked to him on Friday. Uh, our field school was uh, his first time away from home for more than 10 days. He goes to, he went to a community college near where he grew up, and he is now trying to decide between two different um, bachelor's and master's combined programs in the UK. So not only is he moving away from home, he's moving to a different country. <laughs> his mother may be angry at me, but, <laughs> but it's really neat to see what these people do because we meet them at what's really a pivotal kind of time in a lot of these people's lives. It's a time when a lot of things are changing and they're figuring out what they want to do and what they're interested in. And working with us um, can help them figure out whether they like archaeology and also help them see like, oh, I can do this. I have all these choices. It's really fun for me, especially to see people uh, from some of the community colleges and they're working in the same room, doing the same work as people who go to Wellesley and Vassar and places like that. They're all doing the same work. They say, hey, we can all do the same work. That's pretty good to know. So I think this really helps uh, some of our students get an idea of just the options that they have and the things that they can do. We do, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different things that we train our students in, in case you're not familiar with what an archaeological field school is. And some of the things that we do are a little different from most field schools. So our students rotate through different um, sets of activities. One of the obvious things we do, which every pretty much archaeological field school does, is excavation. So uh, our students come out and we teach them to dig. Uh, we teach them to dig carefully. We are working in sites that have been disturbed in the past. The places we've worked on in this field school, uh, they've either been um, in roads. The one we're working on now has been partially plowed. It's flat. You can't see anything from the surface, but there's things under there. So, and we talk a lot about how we choose places to excavate, how we're trying not to disturb really pristine deposits, but we're trying to get really useful information uh, out of some sometimes disturbed contexts and about why we're picking the places to excavate that we're excavating in. Uh, we're not digging up whole sites. We're digging like half of rooms that we've very carefully chosen. We talk with our students about why we chose these places. We're digging half because we can leave the other half. And then if you have another question later, well, why didn't those people do this? That was weird. Uh, half the room's still there. So good. You can go back and check. So uh, they spend a lot of their time excavating, our students do. 
Uh, and we're working in Adobe architecture. So when they first get out there, I think they're a little taken aback because we, we're not working with dental picks here. It's like, here's a pick and a shovel. Um, you're going from this brown dirt to this other color of brown dirt, and that's the wall, so stop there. <laughs> they're like, OK. <laughs> but um, they learn to do it really fast, and it's really fun to have people who've been there for like two or three weeks, then you hand them a pick, and you're like, OK, find the wall. And they go and they find the wall. Here it is. I found the other kind of brown dirt you were looking for. There's the wall. Uh, and it's fun to see people, especially people who've never really used large tools before. Uh, some people are a little bit hesitant about it at first, and then they find out, oh, I'm strong. That's fun to see, too. People stand up a little straighter, and they can use these picks, and they can move this dirt. And it's really fun to watch that. Another thing we train students in is survey. They spend less time on this, which is sort of ironic, because that's probably what they'll be spending most of their time on the rest of their careers. Uh, but we have them spend at least a few days looking for new sites and recording sites that we knew were there but that we need more information on. And we try to emphasize in our survey getting information about places that are going to help uh, land managers with preservation issues. So sometimes we've done site recording for the Gila National Forest, condition assessments where we go back and revisit sites and record what's happened since the last time somebody was here with a map in 1972. Uh, hopefully it's nothing, but sometimes it's quite a lot. Uh, we've also been surveying on a private ranch uh, in the Borough Mountains where the landowners are very interested in erosion control and uh, slowing down the flow of water. And by recording sites uh, near the watercourses on that ranch, they'll know where the sites are so they don't accidentally disturb them when they're building uh, small check dams and things like that for water control. So things like that uh, are what we're trying to do when we survey. And then we also teach the students uh, things like how to map with a GPS, uh, using satellites, and we also teach them how to map with a tape and compass for when your GPS is broken. <laughs> so you can see uh, Lewis Bork, who was a, he's graduated with his PhD from U of A, uh, showing someone how to use the Trimble, which is that bright yellow thing, and then Ashley is using a Brunton compass uh, down at the bottom. Some of our students actually like the compass and tape better, in fact. We do laboratory analysis, which means that the students are doing the preliminary analysis of what they've found in the field, when we get back to camp, that sounds really fun until you've been digging for eight hours and you get back to camp, we're like, okay, lab. <laughs> but um, we don't want people to get bored, so we try and keep people pretty busy. Uh, we focus mostly, mostly on ceramics and lithics. We have a brief exposure to some of the other artifact classes so that when people get back to campus and they're doing things like um, working in museums or volunteering in labs on their campus, they have some exposure to these things. And once you've learned, for example, the ceramics from one place, it's a lot easier to pick up the ceramics from another area. Uh, experimental archaeology is a thing that we do that's a little different in our program. A lot of field schools don't do this. But we're lucky to have Alan DeNoyer, who's really, really good at teaching people how to make things in the way that people in the past would have made them. So our students do things like uh, flint napping, they make projectile points, they use stone tools to carve their own atlatls out of oak sticks, and then they make uh, atlatl darts and they throw them. Uh, they learn to make pottery. Andy Ward from Southern Arizona has come out to do a guest class in pottery making for us for the last couple of years. Uh, they make these uh, replica structures uh, in, that look a lot like the ones that we're excavating in, um, which there's a photo of two of our students working on the doorway. That's, these things are really useful because when the students then find these artifacts, they can understand what they mean a lot better. Uh, not just how to recognize flakes from regular chips of rock, but have some appreciation of how the effort and time that went into making these things. Uh, it's also really useful for understanding uh, how these things came to look the way that they did. I'll never forget the first year we were working out there. We'd been working, excavating in the field. We'd exposed some adobe walls that were about knee high. And they had these weird horizontal and vertical cracks in them that looked almost like bricks. But we knew they weren't bricks because we knew they weren't built that way. And we got back to camp. And Alan's crew had been working on the adobe structure they were building. And it looked exactly the same. The walls that day were the same height. And they had that same weird little crack pattern. And he said, oh, it's the loads of adobe we've been scooping up and then putting on the wall and smoothing into place. And we haven't plastered over them yet. So things like that really help all of us understand what we're seeing better, especially students who haven't seen Adobe architecture eroding before. But really, all of us have learned a lot from, from working with Alan and from experimental archaeology. And then it's also really fun. You can see our students throwing their atlatls at a target. 
uh, we went to visit another field school once and we were talking in the car on the way back, like, oh, what did you think? And our students said, oh, we feel so sorry for them. <laughs> I'm like, well, why? Like, I thought it was, their camp was pretty nice. And, well, we throw Adelaide darts and they have to play Frisbee. <laughs> So we're really lucky to have Alan and have all these opportunities for experimental archaeology that he brings. Uh, another thing we do that's a little different is that we have public outreach events throughout the field season. Alan does a lot of events at local libraries and schools and clubs and things like that uh, in the local communities. And then at the end of our season, we have a big fair where people who live nearby can come and take tours of the site and see the excavations and they talk to all the students about the outreach projects that they've been working on. So each student picks something that they're interested in and want to learn more about. A lot of them tend to pick experimental archaeology things, uh, but some of them also do more traditional sort of research projects, and they make little posters and displays about them and talk about the research that they've done so that everybody can, can see what's been happening. And this is nice because we're working in pretty small towns. We have a pretty big impact. When we stop at the gas station, like you're not getting in and out of that place fast. <laughs> so um, some of the things that we bring are probably good. We're spending a lot of money on snacks. Um, but it can also probably be a little bit of a hassle. Oh, those 20 people are here again. So it's nice to be able to let people who live there know what we're doing. But it's also important for preservation because I think when you're used to seeing the archaeology all around you, and the only interpretation that you're exposed to is the very, very basic level that you get, like on the biggest signs at a national park, for example. You can kind of get the impression that um, archaeologists are just finding out the same things again and again. But by having this fair, we get to talk about the new things that we're finding out every year. And the people who live there see, like, oh, they're finding out new information every year from these sites that are basically in our backyards. So that's really important, too. Uh, we take field trips around the Southwest which this is partly practical because our students don't have cars and they're stuck uh, in the middle of pretty much nothing. <laughs> so we don't want them to get bored. But this has a more important function too, which is that our students get exposed to archeology span from every major culture area and every major time period when they're with us. So when they go back to campus and they're taking archeology span classes and somebody's talking about Pueblo III and the Four Corners or something like that, uh, like they've been to some of these places and they have something to connect that information to. The other part of it's really important is that we visit places like the Tohono O'odham Cultural Center and the Pueblos of Zuni and Akama. And so we're not just talking about the fact that the places where we dig have uh, people, descendants living on the landscape still. People, act, our students are actually meeting people whose ancestors probably lived at some of the places where we're working. And that means a whole lot more than just talking about the fact that that's a thing. When you actually meet people who say, oh yeah, this is where my ancestors lived. Uh, this is some of their pottery. That's pretty amazing and impactful for people. And finally, just the experience of being outside is kind of new for some of our students. Uh, when I was a field school student, only CEOs had cell phones, and the internet was kind of a new thing. So uh, now, a lot of our students have really never not had that. They've never not been connected to everybody that they know 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this is a really big change. Uh, but I think it's very healthy for people. It makes us focus really on each other and the work that we're doing, and we don't have a lot of outside distractions. And it's also just good for people to experience um, like being outside when it's actually dark and you can see the stars and things like that. This is a little different for people, too. So this is another thing that's really different, and I think it really helps people realize that there's so many things that they can do. They can camp in a tent with bugs and sleep on the ground for six weeks, and they're totally fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, they leave knowing a little bit more about themselves and what they're capable of than they did when they arrived. So a lot of our students, as I've mentioned, they do go on in archaeology, but there's always some that say, oh, this is not really a thing that I like. And that's OK, too, because they've still learned a lot. Uh, I think that we're sending people out into the world in whatever capacity they decide to work in who understand and value the past a lot more than they otherwise would. And I always joke with them that if they're having a job interview with an investment banking firm and they get asked that interview question, tell us about a time you faced a hardship at work, they'll have a really good answer when they talk about the time they live in a tent for six weeks. <laughs> so they really learn a lot about archaeology, but also a lot about what they can do and about the world in general, I think. So I'm going to shift gears now away from the people that we work with and what we're teaching them to do and talk a little bit more about why we're doing it and what we're learning from what we do and what the students and staff and everybody who works together is helping to figure out. 
Uh, we're working in the period from 1300 to sometime after 1450. Uh, we're working on Salado archaeology. I'll talk more about what that is. Uh, you can see the Salado culture area on this map. And you can see that the culture areas most people are very familiar with, Ancestral Pueblo or Anasazi, Mugion, and Hohokam are on this map. Salado is this weird see-through blob that covers Mugion and Hohokam, right? Uh, that's a very interesting thing, and I'll talk about what that means. The place where we work, the upper Gila, is where the red arrow is pointing. And this is a really interesting place for a couple of reasons. Uh, the settlement patterns here change over time. A lot of people have heard of Mimbrace, classic Mimbrace especially. Mimbrace is what was going on in the Mugion area kind of before Hohokam. And in the classic Mimbrace period, people were living in big villages, uh, 100 to 200 rooms, lots of people in these towns. And everyone's making pretty much the same kinds of pots. So you can see those black and white pots are really what Mimbrace is famous for. Uh, you can make pots with a lot of different images on them, but there's a very specific set of rules for making those pots. And everybody's making those same kinds of pots in those same kinds of ways, and there's really not a lot of other pottery in those sites. So uh, there's a lot of sort of sameness to being a classic Mimbrace villager in some ways. At about 1130, the landscape changes very much. People leave those big villages, they scatter across the landscape. In some places, not so many people leave, but they just spread themselves out more thinly. In the upper Gila, it looks like a lot of people actually moved to somewhere else nearby, and there's not many people left in the upper Gila, especially in the 1200s. So we go through what here is called the Tularosa phase, a very thin, lightly populated sort of era on the landscape. And then at 1300, the big villages are back, but they're not the same. So big villages, small, thinly scattered populations, big villages again, but these villages look very different. So what is it that's making people come back into these villages? How are they set up? These are the kinds of questions that we're interested in. And also, you might notice the pottery looks very, very different. Why does the pottery look so different? And the answer is it's because it's some of the same people and some different people, too. So um, there's a lot of movement in the late 1200s in the Southwest. And if you're familiar with Mesa Verde, for example, uh, about 1280 is when most people have moved away from there. So the late 1200s are kind of a rough patch in the, the Four Corners area, especially. A lot of people move away. There's been a period of increasing social tension up there in the Four Corners. Uh, power is probably restricted, especially uh, knowledge about certain kinds of things, maybe access to certain resources. And then there's a drought that's probably making some of these issues worse. And it culminates in a lot of social tensions and this becomes not a great place for people to live, and people are not happy with the way that their social system is going up there, so people say, we need to do something different, and they move away. So in southwest Colorado, the Mesa Verde area, we think a lot of these people aren't moving over to the Rio Grande. Uh, in northeast Arizona, we think a lot of these people are moving south. So they're moving away from the Cayenta area of northeastern Arizona, and they're moving south into southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico, and the people from the Cayenta area and the people who already live in these places, who are in the Hoacom and Mugion areas, again, these are archaeological labels, uh, they're combining to form this new thing, which is called Salado. So why do we think that's happening? They're bringing things with them uh, that are very clearly identifiable to us. Uh, some of these things are ways of building houses. We don't see this so much in the upper Gila, so I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot, but the way that you build your house, and especially the entrance to your house, uh, if you're a person from the Cayenta area, looks different than if you're a person from the Mugion or the Hocom area. And so when we see people building a Cayenta-looking house in southeast Arizona, uh, we say, oh, that looks like a Cayenta connection. We also see connections in pottery. You can see that Maverick Mountain pottery is a Cayenta style, and when we see that showing up in new places, you've got two choices, right? Either Cayenta people are coming with their pottery, or a Cayenta pottery is moving. When it's pretty looking pottery like that, you say, oh, maybe the pottery is just moving. But we also see unpretty things moving. And that's that perforated plate you can see in the bottom of the slide. That's a very attractive perforated plate. They're not usually quite that nice. But this is really a household item. And you can see the woman in this reconstruction is using one. It's something that you use as a base when you're making a pot. So it's like a base mold for coiling pottery in. And this is not a pretty thing that's going to get really, really widely traded. This is a thing that people use in their house. Uh, so when we see not so pretty things like this that are just part of people's everyday household goods showing up in a new place, 
that is more of a sign combined with these other kinds of evidence that it's people who are moving and not just stuff that's moving around the landscape. So these people have very identifiable things. They have archaeologically identifiable things. They probably also have much more obvious identifiable things um, to people when everybody's still alive, basically. Uh, they're probably speaking different languages. They're wearing different clothes. They have different customs. They look very, very different. So we've got people from the Four Corners moving south, moving in with people who are already there, and they have really different stuff, and they're speaking a different language, and they look very different. So um, that's like a classic setup of, oh, new people. And you get a kind of us and them scenario. And we think that we can see some evidence of this happening in places in the past. Uh, this is coming from work that Jeff Clark and others at Archaeology Southwest University of Arizona have done in San Pedro area. But we can actually see some of this tension down in the San Pedro of, oh, new people coming in. Uh, when Cayenta people first get to this area, they're sort of spatially separated from everybody else. On this slide, they're down at the south end of that group of settlements that you can see. Uh, Cayenta settlements are down there, spatially separate from everybody else. And one of the things that happens when people are worried about immigration and worried about new people who don't look and talk like them is people build walls. Um, that happened in the past, too. So you can see a couple of examples here. There's a reconstruction of Reeve Ruin. With, it's out on the edge of a mesa with a big wall. And High Mesa also, that's the, the foundation of what used to be a pretty big wall. So we don't see a lot of actual violence here, but we see people who are worried about new people coming in and worried about new people changing things. And we see new people coming who are worried about moving in with this new group that how are they going to fit in? And people are kind of edgy and looking at each other. But it gets better. So after a generation or maybe two, some relatively short, archaeologically speaking, amount of time, although to the people living it, it probably was hard, uh, we start to see people kind of mixing and forming this new thing that's Salado. So some things that are from the Cayenta area continue. For example, we still see perforated plates in people's houses. So again, these people who move, probably their heritage is from the Cayenta area. Their family's been using perforated plates. They still have them. They still use them. They still probably make them in their houses. But they're using them to make not Maverick Mountain anymore. They're making Roosevelt Redware or Salado Polychrome pottery. Uh, this is a new kind of pottery. It has some things that look like the Maverick Mountain, but they're using um, iconography. They're using images on the pottery that come from Mesoamerica, and they're images that we think brought people together and integrated people. Uh, they're linked to fertility and things like that. There's uh, parrots and snakes and birds and a lot of these images that are kind of new. They've been used in the Southwest for a long time, but they're used in a new way here. And by making this new kind of pottery, we think they're really saying, this is a pottery that's ours and this is everybody. You're, some, of, some people are Cayenta and some people are Mugion originally, but they're mixing together and we're all one thing now and this is our pottery now. And we see this over a lot of the Southwest uh, places where immigrants have moved in with people of Hoakam and Mugion heritage are using this new pottery. And in the upper Gila, we see really interesting things that are telling us about the Mugion influence on that mix that becomes Salado. Uh, one of them is the insides of some of these Roosevelt Redware bowls are smudged. That one down in the bottom corner that's black inside, that's what smudging is. So again, that's not like a fancy thing, but that's a very Mugion traditional thing. Uh, it's when you fire your pot, you kind of coat the inside with a layer of soot that gets polished in, and it forms a black, shiny coating on the inside of the pot. And that's a Mugion tradition. It's not something that's necessarily going to spread far and wide because it's fancy. It's, it's a, a Mugion thing that's carried forward and become part of Salado. We also see these uh, mealing features in some rooms, which are, uh, it's built into the floor of the room. It's a place where you can kneel down on the floor, brace your feet against the wall and grind into a matate that's set into the floor of the room and then brush your ground up corn into a bowl that's set into the floor. And again, that's a very characteristic Mugion feature that Cayenta people were not using. So Mugion things and Cayenta things in the upper Gila are coming together into Salado. And I think it's really neat that we can see these things mixing and combining into this new uh, ideology that includes everyone. So it's really encouraging to me to see that we've got these two groups who probably felt kind of tense about each other, and then they merge and they form a new thing that seems to be a purposely inclusive thing with this new kind of pottery. So again, that probably wasn't always an easy thing. Um, again, we have people moving in who look different and have different stuff, and at first everyone was kind of worried. And I'm sure that even after the Salado period kicks in and they have this new ideology that includes everyone, 
It wasn't necessarily everybody happy all the time, but people were pretty happy most of the time. We don't see, <laughs> we don't see archaeological evidence of violence. We don't see, <laughs> we don't see um, differences in the types of houses people had. We don't see that some people had more stuff than others. There's no sign that like, oh, if your ancestors are more muggy owned, you get higher status pots or something like that. There's really nothing like that. Everybody has the same stuff. So there may have been differences still in people's minds, but there wasn't anything playing out uh, materially that made some people disenfranchised and some people not, that made some people powerful and some people not. We don't see material evidence of that. And that's really pretty good for a couple of generations and this much movement. So I think that's a very encouraging thing to see. The Cliff Valley is a really great place to study this uh, because one of the questions we had coming in was, well, how does this happen? because it's kind of nice to know how to help people integrate and form a cohesive society without fighting, right? <laughs> so we're wondering, can the Cliff Valley tell us more about how this process occurs, how people manage to do this? And the answer is that it seems to be quite different in different places. If you read about uh, what Salado archaeology looks like, it, up here it's called the Cliff Phase, named after the Cliff Valley. What does Cliff Phase archaeology look like? Uh, you'll get a sort of standard description uh, big room blocks arranged around a courtyard with a wall, and the wall foundations are made of stones, and it's adobe on top of that. So we're thinking, oh, well, all these sites are probably going to look kind of the same. Well, they don't at all. Uh, they all look very different. Here you can see three sites where Archaeology Southwest has excavated, and another site that was part of a highway project, which is Ormond Village. They all have very different site plans. The maps look very different. Uh, some of them have big blocks of rooms arranged around an open area in the center that was probably a plaza. Uh, Dinwoody kind of looks like that. There's no wall there though. You see that big trench? We're looking for the wall and there isn't one, so it doesn't fit the sort of classic plan that way. Gila River Farm doesn't have anything that looks like room blocks grouped around a plaza. We have two blocks of rooms kind of in a line. Uh, the sites all look different. The walls are built in different ways. There's different kinds of adobe. There's different kinds of rocks used as wall foundations set up in different ways. Some of these villages, the corners all line up very neatly and they look like somebody planned them out. If you hear ads for a master plan community way north of Tucson, um, they kind of look like that. Some of them have a master plan-ish look, but others really don't. The corners don't line up. The rooms were clearly added one at a time, kind of as people needed them and no one was really worried about the master plan. So uh, it looks like when they're figuring out how to have everybody live together in these big groups, there's more than one way of doing that. When we start to look more closely with insights, we see a lot of variability there too. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in right now, especially because I've been working on a poster with one of our students from last summer, Steve Uzzle, is um, different signs of how often people moved and how long they stayed in these rooms. So uh, if you look at the architecture, for example, if you think about walking on an adobe floor, the more foot traffic there is, the more often you're going to have to repair that floor and put another layer of plaster on it. Um, so you can see how much walking happens and how often people have to fix their floors. That's a little bit different from repairing the structure. Uh, if you have posts holding up your roof, the traffic doesn't really impact how often you need to replace the post. It's more like how long the post is there, uh, how long does it take for termites to get in it. Uh, remodeling, how often do you actually decide to knock walls down and make your rooms bigger or expand uh, in different ways, and then trash buildup. Are people putting trash, are they throwing it somewhere we can't see, which mostly seems to be what they're doing. They're probably throwing it off the edge of the terrace into the river valley. Are people filling up rooms with trash, which shows that there's abandoned rooms sitting open that are a good place to put your trash in. Uh, when new rooms get built, are they built on top of trash deposits from people who've already been living there, or are they built on just um, culturally sterile deposits? These things vary quite a bit from room to room and from site to site up there, really more than I had realized until we started working on this poster. If you look inside the rooms, people finish using them in different ways. They're making different decisions about what to leave on the floors when they leave. Some rooms are pretty much cleaned out. Somebody took all the useful things. Sometimes it even looks like they swept them. There's so little in there. And then they leave and the room fills up with dirt. Other times, especially the site we've been working at lately, Gila River Farm, people did purposeful things to the floors of the rooms. There was a room we excavated in last summer where people left uh, the leg and wing bones of hawks, especially red-tailed hawks and the leg and wing bones of water birds. Um, uh, what were they? I'm blanking on which ones they were. An egret and a loon, I think. Um, and it, it looks like they were leaving whole legs and whole wings on the floor of the room. Not whole birds, but body parts. But they weren't articulated anymore. 
which suggests to us that they put these legs and wings on the floor, and then they left, and the room was open, and various things happened to disturb the bones a little bit, like rodents ran around in there and stuff like that. So they didn't bury the legs and wings. They left them on the floor, and then they moved away. Uh, that's one room. Another room in that same area, the floor was covered in um, what Leslie described as bony loam soil texture. <laughs> it was the dirt it had so much bone in it that it was like half bone, half dirt. And some of that bone is buried, and a lot of it is fish. So we probably have at least 400 fish bones from this, this room. Um, the most fish bone I'd ever seen in a site from the upper Gila or the Membrace was 20. So this is very, very different. Um, we have a sample of one room of each of these kinds, so we don't know what they mean yet. But clearly, people are doing very different things in the rooms that they're living in when they decide to move away. Uh, other things that are very different from place to place. Gila River Farm also has some evidence of pottery making there, which we've kind of been expecting to see because we know people were making uh, these Roosevelt redwares somewhere in the upper Gila. But the Gila River Farm seems to have a lot of these perforated plates, which again are used for making pottery. You can see Emily uh, discovering a shirt looking very excited uh, of a perforated plate, because the students know that Jeff loves that stuff, and they're super <laughs> excited when they find it. And then we can see another Emily finding a grinding stone that has pigment ground into it. And that may also be something that's related to pottery production if you're grinding up uh, pigments for paint. So this is something we're still investigating. This is kind of new information, but it'd be really interesting to, to know whether pottery was being produced there. And then another site we've worked at with the field school called Dinwiddie, there's evidence for shell production there. And Chris Lang has identified this um, anodonta, which is a freshwater mussel. And these mussels, apparently, um, part of their life cycle, they live in the gills of freshwater fish. And there's an argument now about what the native range of these mussels actually was, because we've dammed and pumped the water out of so many of the southwestern rivers that they don't have fish in them anymore, and they don't have mussels in them anymore. And we're not totally sure where the, where the range of these mussels was. Uh, but it turns out, thanks to Chris, I know this, um, this particular mussel shell, you can only make things out of it for a day or two after you harvest the mussel, or it becomes so brittle that you can no longer work it. So this site of Dinwiddie, has evidence that people were making the shells of these mussels into jewelry at that site. So that tells you the mussel must have lived there in the past, because you're not going to go running, really running, with mussel shell, probably from another river all the way up there. But this is interesting, too, because it's suggesting that not only are these villages built in different ways, but people are doing different things at them. Some villages, people have pottery production going on. Other villages, people are making things out of shell. Rooms within the villages, some of them have birds in them, some of them have fish in them. They're doing all of these different things. So this is interesting, too, because it's telling us that there's not just one way to form these multi-ethnic communities. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and people are doing it in a lot of different ways, and this is a very characteristic human thing. Another thing that I'm interested in is how people are using the plants and animals in these communities. And one thing that I've looked at is how the different kinds of animals on the landscape change in sites over time. Uh, I've looked at this thinking about species that are resilient to things people do and less resilient. So um, resilient ones, that means resilient to hunting and also to landscape changes, things like cutting down all the trees for firewood and building wood, um, turning land into fields instead of whatever it was before. There's all kinds of vegetation changes that go along with what people do and not just hunting. But um, generally, the less resilient things tend to be bigger animals that breed more slowly. In the southwest, that's deer. In other places, deer are very resilient, but here, not so much. Uh, whereas the more resilient things are little things that breed like rabbits. Um, the, uh, the less resilient things tend to be a little pickier sometimes. For an example, an animal that has a very, very specialized habitat requirement, when humans come in and change that habitat, it's not so good for that animal. Resilient things, they don't care put a field there, they'll just keep on breeding away. Um, there, a lot of these things are food. People will eat a lot of different things, but not everything. So that's not necessarily that much of a difference between the more and less resilient things. Um, but there's a lot of prestige attached to some of the less resilient animals. Uh, if you go out hunting and you shoot a deer with big antlers, you put that head on your wall. If you put a bunny head on your wall, it's a joke. So, <laughs> but what this means is that um, the less resilient things, people will put a lot of effort into finding a deer on the landscape. If you start running low on rabbits, you'll get a squirrel instead or something like that. Uh, there's, that's not always true, but in general, uh, there tend to be things that do really well under human pressure and things that do less well. 
So what happens when you look at the things that do well under pressure and the things that don't over time? Uh, this graph, all you need to know about it really is what happens at the end. Uh, I'm looking at the proportion of more and less resilient things. What happens to the sensitive things over time? So this graph, higher on the graph, means more sensitive things. And the cliff phase, the Salado period, the period I'm talking about, uh, all the lines on the graph point up. That means that the things that don't do as well under human pressure are doing a lot better in the cliff phase than they have before. So that's very interesting. Why is that happening? I talked at the beginning about the pattern we have of big villages, lots of people, small settlements, few people, big villages, lots of people again. So one obvious part of the answer is, oh, things are recovering during that period of 150 years or so when there's very few people on the landscape. That's the 1200s. So that's probably a lot of it. But remember the time period I'm talking about now, Cliff Phase Salado, is about 150 years also. Uh, it only takes about 25 years of hunting to start to see a very, very appreciable impact on sensitive big animals. We know this from places in the archaeological record where we have very fine-grained data like the Four Corners. We know this from people who work in the tropics now. When you see people moving into a new patch of forest in the Amazon within about 25 years, you see a big change in the animals that are available to them. So if that happens in 25 years, why can we still see better off sensitive things in a 150-year period? Uh, I'm still not sure, but I've been thinking lately that that may be related to people moving around more often. That, that research I was talking about, um, looking at floors and walls and how often they're repaired, maybe people move a little bit more in the 1300s than they did before. Uh, but whatever the answer is, we're starting to see that maybe people in the cliff phase, they're not just living in a way that includes people from a lot of different ethnic backgrounds, but something about what they're doing also seems to be a little easier on some of the resources around them too. And understanding how people manage that is pretty useful and important as well for some of the, the challenges that we face now. So this picture kind of symbolizes to me a lot of what we've been talking about today. Because every summer, we go out on this project and we bring a bunch of new people together. Uh, this is from 2014 when I first got here. And I knew one staff member, Will Russell, already. And everybody else I met for the first time like a month or two before we got out there to the field. Uh, and these people are my best friends now. We got to be really good friends in like a week. But the first week was hard because we brought all these different things with us. The screen that Will is leaning against with great affection is from the 1970s and it's one of the screens that the Membrace Foundation used when they were working on Membrace sites and it's a very muggy owned screen. <laughs> and <laughs> the blower that Stacy is holding is a leaf blower that's used on Hocom excavations and it's for blowing off the floors and walls and things like that so that you can see Adobe architecture better. And that's a very Hoacom archaeology uh, tradition. So we have these Mugion and Hoacom archaeological traditions, field traditions that we're bringing together. We had arguments about all kinds of stuff like what color pen to use and what kind of graph paper to use. Um, because we have all these archaeologists with a lot of experience and very strong opinions. And we ended up with a kind of hybrid of the best of all of these things that we think works really, really well. And every year this happens again. We get a new group of students who come from all different places, and they have to figure out how to make it work. But we all have goals in common, and we end up working for the same thing. And the thing that we're working on is something with a lot in common with that situation. We're working in a place where people came from different traditions and started to move in together and figure out how to do things together uh, without fighting about graph paper. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, that, when I see that picture, I think of this. I think of how much our social situation mirrors what we're working on. And I think also about how much what we're working on now can really tell us about problems that we're still having. Um, things like how do you bring people together from different places and make sure that not only do they get along, but you have traditions that can include everyone and nobody ends up disenfranchised uh, and without power in that situation. Uh, people in the cliff phase in the upper Gila made it work, again, without archaeologically visible evidence of violence or big social differences for 150 years. And then they did something else that's very hard for archaeologists to see, but also didn't seem to end badly at all. So people solved this problem before. A lot of the problems that we see people have had before, we see social tension, we see people worrying. That's a very human thing, especially when people are moving and situations are changing, people worry. That's very natural, and we see that in the past. But we also see in the past that people can solve that problem, and people can find ways to live together that include everybody. 
uh, and find a, a system that works for a very long time. And so whenever things are kind of going badly, I think, oh, it's happened before. It'll probably happen again. And people have ways of solving these problems, and we can still do it. So thank you. I hope that makes you feel hopeful also. <laughs> Thank you to all these people who've uh, supported our research. Uh, some of them are you. I talked a lot about uh, the National Science Foundation that funds some of our field work and the students, but a lot of the post-field analyses and the ways we find out all these interesting things about what kinds of bone and pottery and things like that are in the sites, uh, a lot of that is funded by places like the U University of Arizona Foundation and all of you members of Archaeology Southwest, so thank you especially. So the, the questions about um, ideas that we have about movement uh, and when and why and where people moved in the past and whether the traditional archaeological evidence that we have for that uh, is also being investigated with DNA evidence. Um, the answer to that is it's complicated because, again, the descendants of a lot of these people are still alive and a lot of people don't feel real great about having their DNA looked at. Um, Probably a lot of people in this room don't feel very great about that either. So there's, um, it's, it can be hard to figure out um, exactly whose permission people need to do some of these studies. So depending on who you ask, some people are very interested in having it done and some people are not. And uh, we need to respect everybody's uh, feelings about looking at the DNA of some of these remains. So uh, as far as direct testing of human remains, uh, there's been some, but it's not something that we archaeologists do on a regular basis. Uh, there are potentially ways of looking at that with DNA without testing human remains. People have talked about doing this with dogs and turkeys and things like that, for example. Um, but generally, it also, the more people move, the more complicated the answer is going to be. Some of the movements that we're talking about are a pretty long time ago, and people moved multiple times. So um, people didn't just move from the four corners, like from... Um, Mesa Verde to the Rio Grande, for example. Then some members of that family may have moved back or moved to a different place. Uh, a lot of the Pueblos today, if you ask people who live there now, they'll say like, they have a very complicated uh, migration story about how the people who live there now ended up there. And there are a lot of movements in some of those stories. So uh, people in some families, their ancestors may have come from like five or six or seven different places in the Southwest many generations in the past. So it also, even if we did look at DNA evidence for all of these migrations that we're guessing about based on archaeological evidence, I imagine it would be much more complicated than, uh, than we think because people move so often and because families and uh, lineages and pueblos can have so many different stories uh, of the people who lived there before they came to that place. Does that make sense? Uh, she's asking how the funding looks from the National Science Foundation. Um, I don't know. We just kind of go along doing the best we can, really. Uh, I, every few years, we all kind of panic because news cycles come up like, oh, people um, don't want to fund the National Science Foundation anymore, or people don't want to fund social science. Uh, so far, the bottom hasn't fallen out of it. So we try and just keep a hopeful sort of attitude. But I think one of the things that we can do is we can talk about the interesting things that we do learn with funding from those places. I've tried to be better about that. When I was, I don't know, like 10 years ago when I'd give a presentation, the last slide would just say, oh, thanks to the National Science Foundation, and I wouldn't particularly talk about it. Now I feel like it's actually important to go around and say, look, the National Science Foundation did this. Yay! <laughs> this is where that money is going. We're learning interesting things from it. Because uh, I don't want people to think that that funding disappears into some void and it only ends up in a journal that most people don't want to read. It's useful information that I think a lot of people would be interested in the results of. And usually that acknowledgement is buried at the end of everything. But if we talk a little bit more about, hey, the National Science Foundation funded the research that says this cool thing, I think that's probably beneficial to everybody in this situation. So the question's about um, pots and whether they're decorated on the inside or the outside and why. Uh, one common way of looking at that is that things that are painted on the inside are things that you see when you're holding the pot or serving something out of it. And so they're aimed at a smaller number of people. And things that you see on the outside of a pot are supposed to show to everybody. Like if you have an event like this and you carry the pot around, everyone can see the outside and no one can really see the inside. 
Um, people have done studies looking at how big the bowls are and whether the decorations on the inside or the outside. And a lot of times the bigger bowls do have decorations on the outside. So it's probably related to the kind of occasion when you use that pot. These are like the good dishes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so these are not, I mean, the everyday stuff is plain and brown and no one's really necessarily bothering, but your good dishes, uh, there's good dishes for when your family is over maybe and you're gonna see the inside and there's good dishes for when you have a big party and people are gonna see the outside and that's probably what that is related to. Yes. Um, right now, the funding for the field trips in the summer is tied into that same NSF grant. Um, so it's really, really helpful for us. We, we're applying again uh, this fall. We'll see how it turns out. But uh, the grants are for two or three years. And so far, we've been really lucky in writing our proposals so that we can get these grants that pay for these things. Yes? I was wondering about uh, specific donations from the public. Um, so far... Because of the way the NSF grant is, is set up, uh, we've tended to use um, the NSF money just for things that happen in the field because that's really what it funds. The NSF money only pays for things that the students experience. Um, when we want to pay for things like analyzing the things after we get back, um, NSF doesn't cover that at all. So we've tended to use the sort of general funding that we can access from places like U of A Foundation, Archaeology Southwest members for, for the post-field things. Some of those involve the students too, like some of these projects I was talking about. Is it possible for the public to make donations to Archaeology Southwest in specifically for these fields? Um, I don't know. You have to ask Linda. <laughs> Linda, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I tend to not, um, I tend to not deal, Linda knows why. Um, I tend to not deal with the budgets very much. Whenever I do a budget, there's a problem with rounding error in my Excel spreadsheets. So really all of the funding things, I come up with budgets and I give them to Linda and Camelia and they fix the terrible mistakes that I've made and we figure out how to fund things. So if you have any sorts of questions about funding, I would well, talk to her. Yeah, I think, and I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think Karen actually um, addressed it pretty well. But um, that is sort of a challenge we have like with a program like this in a way because the National Science Foundation um, grant is really great and it will cover the direct costs for the students to pretty much have their summer experience. But it doesn't pay for Karen or for any of the staff that go along on that experience and it doesn't pay for the analysis when we get back. So you know, we, we have this pot of money that's really critical to help the kids in the field, but like Karen is saying, there's this much broader, when we get back, we have to do all the analysis. We have five or six full-time staff members out there all summer long. So if you're interested in supporting the field school program, there definitely is a need. And um, your support could help us make sure we have the right kind of staff and everybody else on board so that those kids really get all the great experience they that they deserve. So it's an issue of just how to parcel it all up. But the field school definitely is in need of further support. We think it's an important program and um, archaeology is expensive and the biggest expense is that post field analysis kind of stuff. So anyway, back to Karen. <laughs> yes. The question regards to corporate finance, corporate You know, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, we haven't had much success there. And to be perfectly honest, Tucson's not a really great big corporate giving. There, there's not a lot of corporate giving available even in Tucson. So, um, and we're over in New Mexico. We're over in southwestern New Mexico, which is really, really low population. So it's it's sometimes difficult to attract the corporate attention because it's not in a big, big city. It's not a lot of people. It's not something you can put a name on. So I would love to talk corporate if anybody had any great ideas, but we have yet to be very successful down that road. But anyway, thank you. <laughs>